It's an honor to be here this morning and have the opportunity to be your speaker. And I hope the things that we have to study and to share will be encouraging and edifying. And I hope it will give us a better understanding of the passage found in the 14th chapter of the Gospel of John. In this passage, the Bible reads, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. This appears to be a pretty straightforward passage of Scripture. And I think throughout the history, ever since John had inked these words, we have understood them very plain and in the context in which they're written. Unfortunately, there have been some who in recent times, not just amongst us, but in the academic realm, that have tried to reinterpret the passage in really verse 2 and 3 of the 14th chapter of the Gospel of John. So we want to examine this passage and see what all we can learn. Six things I want to have under consideration for you this morning. Number one, I want to very briefly look at the context. Number two, we're going to deal with troubled hearts. Number three, and this is where we're going to get in the heart of the manner, that we're going to talk about the Father's house followed by mansions, preparations, and we want to ask the question, where is Jesus? And so when we talk about the context of John chapter 14, what we commonly say, and I've said it a hundred times when I've been preaching, and you probably have as well, remember John chapter 14 through 16 is the farewell discourse. It's a private conversation between Jesus and His disciples. And that's accurate, and that is correct. We usually go on to say something like, Whatever promises are found in these few chapters are private that Jesus is giving to His disciples and they're meant for Him. They're not meant for Christians, uh, the everyday Christian for us today. Primarily the promise of the Holy Spirit. And that is something that we've always talked about and that we've always uh, understood. Now, it appears to me that there is a little bit of a broader contextual basis than just chapters 14 through 16. If you back up to chapter 13, you will discover Jesus has this conversation with His disciples. And He begins to tell them some things that are uneasy for them. Anxiety begins to build. He talks about one of them that's going to betray Him. He speaks of the fact that Peter is going to deny Him. And then in verse 30, Judas leaves. He departs from the presence of the group. And in verse 31, he really begins the discourse. And so in 1331 is where this begins. He runs all the way through chapter 16, but chapter 17 is the prayer that is given by Jesus right after he has uh, given this farewell discourse. And so I would say the context is 1331 all the way through chapter 17. Now, I want to deal with some troubled hearts. And here's the, the really crux of the matter of what's taking place. The word trouble means to cause turmoil, to stir up. And these disciples are uneasy, they're anxious, they, they have fear. And the question is this, why would they be troubled? Why is Jesus telling them not to worry, calm down, everything's going to be all right? Well, I think there's a number of points. First of all, He just told them one of them is going to betray Him. And they just can't hardly fathom. How could one of us who has spent the last three years traveling and beholding your works, how could one of us betray you? Then Peter is told that he's going to deny Jesus. How would Peter, who appears to at least somewhat be the leader of the group, deny Jesus? Then there's the memorial of his death, that is, the institution of the Lord's Supper that he gives it. Now, that's not found in John's account, but that is found in the other accounts. So if we put a harmony of what's taking place, we know at this time, this is what takes place. He tells them that they are going to be scattered, and he mentions on multiple occasions of his departure. But he begins in verse 1 of chapter 13 to tell them that he's going to die. And they're looking at Jesus. Here's Jesus. And in their mind, from a Jewish concept, He's the Messiah. He's the one that is going to usher in the kingdom. And we're going to be servants of His kingdom. And He's going to die? Well, obviously, there was a misconnect. And you're very familiar with that. 
But Jesus provides words of assurance in this discourse. In、uh, 1427, this is what he has to say Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And then in chapter 16 and verse 22, he tells them, I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. What is he talking about? I think he's probably talking about the Messianic promises. They accepted them. Go all the way back to John chapter 1, and we have the call of the disciples, or at least the first few. And、uh, it becomes pretty evident that they accept him. Remember Nathaniel when he says, My Lord and my King. We're going to get back to verse 51 in just a few minutes. So if you believe in God, then believe in me. And there's some very important promises that are made in this discourse. He promises that he's going to send the Holy Spirit. Chapter 14, verses 16 through 18, and verse 26. Chapter 16, verse 7, and again in verse 13. These are all passages that we're familiar with and we teach on them often. He tells them that he's going to come back. That's what he says in verse 3. He brings that to their attention again in verse 28. He also promises the hope of a heavenly home. And that's the focus of our study of what is he talking about in verses 2 and 3. But we're going to get to verse 17 and verse 24 as we get to the end of the conclusion and see what he has to say. In that particular verse. So let's get into the meat and talk about the Father's house for just a minute. Now, what's unique about this is the language that is used in the 14th chapter of the Gospel of John. The term house, my Father's house, comes from the Greek word ekia, and all that it simply means is a structure used as a dwelling or a house. And this is very important. This is where it kind of gets somewhat deep, but this is very important. And this is the linchpin of the argument about why Jesus is talking about heaven. So it is claimed by some in the modern academic world today that the Father's house refers to the temple. And this statement is often made. If we are going to consider the cultural historical context of the passage, and I want to stop right there. We have not been very good over the years, or we have failed over the years, at least I have. And I think when we're young, getting started,、uh, this is a concept that's hard for us to grasp. We have not been very good about considering the historical, cultural, geographical context when it comes to a passage. And when we talk about context, usually we back up to where the pericope begins and we go to where it ends. And we say, okay, this is the con, well, that's the immediate part. But there's a little more to context than that. And we also have done a pretty poor job of considering the contextual setting of the book, such as what is the purpose of this book? Who is the author? And what points are they making? And so as you're going from pericope to pericope throughout the book, what is the argumentation that he's making to support, to support the purpose of the book? And so the argument is if we want to consider the historical cultural context, this is a Jew, Jesus, speaking to Jews, his disciples. And when he says, My father's house, the first thing that's going to come to the mind of the Jews is what was said back in chapter 2. Remember the temple cleansing in chapter 2. Jesus talks about the temple in verse 16, and he tells us that、uh, you have taken my father's house and turned it into a house of merchandise. Is what the New King James Version says. Therefore, it's claimed that the Father's house is talking to the temple. And from an English perspective, that sounds pretty reasonable. But the New Testament wasn't written in English. This is not referring to the physical temple in Jerusalem in this passage. First of all, Jesus is going somewhere. And I would like to tell you, he starts that process. In chapter 13, but that's not true. He starts that process in chapter 7 to tell them that I'm going somewhere. And we're going to note in just a moment, over and over, Jesus has been preparing them for some time for the fact that he is going to go somewhere. He's going somewhere. Where is he going? He's going to the Father's house, that is heaven. He's not going to the temple. What's he going to do to go to the temple? That doesn't make sense. What preparation is he going to make for the temple? What rooms are going to be prepared in the temple? That just seems inconsistent and illogical. John 
cannot be what Jesus is talking about in John chapter 14. Now, here's the key to the argument that I'm going to present. And this is found in McCaffrey's book, The House with Many Rooms. The term Achaia, now in John 14 too, just a moment ago, a couple slides ago, I showed you the Greek term that is used for house is Achaia. The term Achaia is never found in Jewish tradition to designate the temple, either earthly or heavenly. It's never used that way in Jewish literature. It must be granted the term ikos would appear at first sight to be one of the best suited for John 14, 2 through 3, if the evangelist wished to convey only the meaning temple. It would conform to the Old Testament use of the phrase ikos to theo, which was the common term for the temple in Jewish tradition. This can't be overlooked. And this is very important. The term house that is used in John 14, 2 is, uh, is different than the term house that is used in John chapter 2. So in John chapter 2, when he calls the temple the Father's house, he's using different language than what he's using in John 14, verse 2. Now in John 14, 2, the term that is used is never used in Jewish literature to describe the temple. And he could have used the term that was commonly used to describe the temple. But the writer doesn't do that. By the way, as a side note, and I don't know it's a big deal, but I just thought this was interesting. Uh, in John 2, 14 and 15, the word temple is found a few times. And it comes from the Greek term hieron. And it was of interest, at least to me as I was looking into this, that that term is nowhere found in chapters 14 through 16. And if Jesus was really talking about the temple, why did he not use that term somewhere in the discourse? He had opportunity to, but he chose not to. To go on a little bit more, McCaffrey says, both terms, ikos and ikea, are found in a transferred sense. So it's perfectly intelligible that the term ikos should be uh, used in a metaphor metaphorical sense to designate the house of God, his temple. The use of ikea to designate an ordinary house building does occur, but it is never used to designate the temple. On the other hand, the, for, uh, the phrase ikos Tothayu becomes a fixed term for the sanctuary temple. And so uh, the term Ikea that is found in John 14, 2 is very common. I think it, off the top of my head, it's found 85 times in the New Testament. And it just simply means the house. And so this argument that Jesus, when he says the Father's house, is talking about the temple is illogical because the language is not that which was used. If he really wanted to talk about the temple he would have used a different term. But even that, had he used the term ekos, had he used it, he did not, but had he, there is still a reference to the Father's house or to heaven using that term. Now, the scriptures that Jesus and his disciples primarily used were the Septuagint. Sometimes I say the Bible that Jesus used was the Septuagint. That seems like an odd statement. But the, the scriptures that Jesus and his disciples used were the Septuagint. And the common Jew of the day would read from the Septuagint and they would speak Greek and Aramaic. The common Jew did not go around speaking Hebrew. And uh, David kind of touched on this a little bit yesterday. And so we think here 2,000 years removed that the Jews were running around the world during the time of Jesus and they were all speaking in Hebrew. That's not the case. Probably in Jerusalem, the scribes and the scholars and lawyers and things like that were, but the average person was not. They were not reading the Old Testament in Hebrew. They're reading the, the Septuagint that's written in Greek. That's the common language that they're used to. Now in Deuteronomy chapter 26 and verse 15, as we look at the Septuagint, the pastor says, Look down from your holy house, ekois, from heaven. He uses the term ekois to describe heaven or the Father's house. So to make this argument, and Nathan does a very good job pointing this out and, and puts it way better than I could ever phrase it. To make the argument that the term Ecos, or Father's house, is never used in Jewish writing or literature to talk about heaven is a false argument. They cannot make that argument. It's very clear that it is used to talk about heaven in certain times. Now, while we're on this whole temple heaven thing, I just want to bring up a couple of passages for you to consider. 
we find in Revelation this theme. So in verse 7, we read, Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in His temple. Question, where is God's throne? Well, I don't have to answer that because the Scriptures answer it. In 1119, John writes, Then the temple of God was opened in heaven. And it's clarified in chapter 14 of verse 17 when he says another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven. I thought that was interesting language that is used by John. But I want to move on and ask the question, where's the Father? If Jesus is going to the Father's house, where is the Father? He's in heaven. That's where He's at. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16, we read the phrase, Father in heaven. In Matthew 16 verse 17, we read read the phrase, My Father which is in heaven. I went and looked this up, and the best I could tell, the phrase, Father in heaven, or Father which is in heaven, or Father who is in heaven, however you want to compile that, it appears to me it is found 18 times in the New Testament. Now, I read the argument that it was found 21 times, and I, I only found it 18 But I ran out of fingers, and so uh, maybe I'm wrong on that. But nonetheless, I counted that phrase 18 times in the New Testament. So let's talk about the house of God for just a minute. And let's go back to the Old Testament. In Genesis chapter 28, we find in verse 12 these words. Then he dreamed, and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth, and its top reached to heaven, And there the angels of God were ascending and descending upon it. Now this is Jacob's dream where he sees this ladder going from earth to heaven and God stands above this ladder. Here's angels ascending and descending uh, on this ladder. What this is teaching is the house of God, that is heaven, is directly connected. Let's go to verse 16 and 17. When Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place? There is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. Where does this ladder go to? The house of God. What is the house of God? Heaven. Now, what's important about this is this translates to the New Testament, to the gospel that we're dealing with. Let's go to John chapter 1. In John chapter 1, I told you just a moment ago, Jesus begins at the latter part of John chapter 1 calling His disciples. And so it's a fascinating passage of Scripture as He calls uh, Andrew and Peter. And, but then He gets to Nathaniel. And Nathaniel's like, I'm not sure about this. Come and see. Just come and see. And Jesus says, I saw you when you were sitting under the fig tree. And that's when He says, my Lord and my God. And Jesus says, you think that's neat? You haven't seen anything yet. And in verse 51, he says, Most assuredly, I say to you, hereafter you shall see heaven open and the angels ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. What's he teaching? Jesus is the ladder to heaven. Jesus is the way to heaven. I'm only going through verse 3, but continue reading to verse 4 and look at the connection of what Jesus is saying. Nathan in his article, Defending Heaven, writes, It is critical to understand that God's presence or place on earth always connects earth to heaven. Jesus came to tabernacle among men, John 1.14, so the earth could be connected with heaven, John 1.51. The tabernacle, temple, and church were all designed to connect people of earth with God in heaven. To deny such a concept is to miss the entire reason the tabernacle and temple were created and how they anticipated the arrival of the church. Now we're going to deal with church here in uh, just a moment. But as we do, I want to get introduced to the thought of mansions. Now, if you've listened to anything on the internet about this passage of Scripture in the last year or so. There is a whole lot at the beginning of a presentation to talk about the term mansion. And they go to great lengths to say that the word mansion, that's not really what it means. And so what you think a mansion means, this great big elaborate house, maybe the most the wealthiest person in your community lives in a mansion, this great big huge house. Heaven's going to be filled with them and you're going to have one just like that. No, that's not what the passage is teaching. It just simply means room. It comes from the Greek word uh, monē, which just simply means a dwelling place or a room. 
And what they want to do is they want to destroy your confidence in the passage of a poor translation from the very beginning so that you will follow along illogically and not catch some of the other conclusions that they jump to in their poor、uh, exegesis of the text. That's what they want you to do. So that's a pretty common tactic. Let's destroy your confidence in something right now from the very beginning. And once you're like, oh, I didn't know that, then let me rebuild it how I want you to view it. That's the position that. That has been rendered in this passage. So I don't think that,、um, that this is a, I do think this is a poor choice of word in the translation, in a modern translation. I don't think it should destroy our confidence in the passage. I think what it really shows is the need for really good, accurate, modern translations in our vernacular. And it's not as bad as it really is. So, if you look at Kostenberger right here, he says the rendering mansions rather than rooms. By the way, the New King James, that's what a lot of us use, does keep the terminology mansion.、Uh, and because、uh, that's the way that it's rendered in the, the King James, and it is a, a, one of the favorite sayings of ours. We sing a lot of songs about that. So, it kept that word mansion. But if you look at some of the more modern translation, it just simply says rooms. I think the ESV、uh, says rooms, which is a little more accurate. But he says, rather than rooms, which crept into the English translation through William Tyndale in 1526 via the Vulgate, mistakenly suggests luxurious accommodations in modern parlance. The Latin word mansion referred to a stopover place, which was still the meaning of mansion in Tyndale's day. So, here's what happened the Latin Vulgate had this term. Tyndall makes his translation.、Uh, he has it into English. The King James Version comes along, and I love the King James Version, but there are gobs of problems with it, and we do not speak 400 year old English. And so、uh, it comes along, and it uses all kinds of sources. It draws on all kinds of sources to develop their translation, one of which is Tyndale's translation. And so when they do, they render the word mansion. Now, at the time, it just simply meant a place to stop, a room to stay in. The point is not the dwelling. The point is this there's plenty of room in heaven for you. Don't worry about running out of room. The hotel's not going to be booked up and be full, and you're going to say, sorry. There's plenty of room, is what Jesus is trying to convey in this passage. Kostenberger goes on to say the only other New Testament occurrence of the term Monet is found in 1423, where it is said that Jesus and the Father will come and make their dwelling with the believer. However, whereas in 1423 it is clear that spiritual indwelling of believers is in view, and 1402 refers to a reality external to Jesus' followers. This does not need to be missed, because if we're going to be careful students and consider the context, we need to consider the context all the way through. So the word Monet, unfortunately, is only found twice in the Bible. In John 14, at the beginning, when Jesus says, In my Father's house are many mansions, and then again in verse 23. Now, I think D.A. Carson probably describes it the best. He says, the only other place the word occurs in the New Testament is 1423. My Father and I will come to Him and make our home with Him, i.e., the believer indwelt by the Spirit, thus becomes the dwelling place and hence the home of the triune God. It is by reading this referent into the word in verse 23 back into verse 2 that Gundry, and I'll stop right here, I've pulled this text out. If you go pick up D.A. Carson and you, you back up, Gundry is taking the position that、uh, this is the temple, which is the church, because there's this temple church analogy. And、uh, that's found because of the word Monet. And so he's, he's dealing with what Gundry is having to say. Craig Keener is another one who takes this position. But Gundry finds warrant for this view.、Uh, coming of Jesus in verse 2 and 3 is the bestowal of the Spirit. The fact remains the word Monet simply means. Dwelling place. There's no more reason to read the referent of the word, i.e., what the dwelling place the word refers to in verse 23, back into verse 2, than the reverse. Both instances, the context must decide. Jesus is talking about something external at the beginning in, verse,、uh, in chapter 14, and as he gets deeper and he uses the term in verse 23, he's talking about something internal. By the way, it is my understanding.、Uh, D.A. Carson and Andreas Kostenberger are probably the most preeminent scholars on the Gospel of John right now.、Uh, I would 
probably make that as the case. And after reading uh, several commentaries on John, they obviously have a pretty good handle on it. It's my understanding that both of them believe in a view of the refurbished earth. And uh, despite the fact they believe in a refurbished earth, they still say that John 14 is talking about heaven. They don't buy this other modern uh, terminology that's talking about the temple or that it's talking about the church. They still say it's talking about heaven. And I think that's a pretty important thing to, uh, to consider. Now, here's the argument. He's talking about the temple, which the language does not allow. There's a connection between this temple church, which I think we all recognize. Therefore, he's talking about the church. Let me give you about five reasons or so why this passage is not talking about the church. It's talking about heaven instead. Number one, the Jews, if we're going to make this careful argument about this historical cultural context thing, have no concept of the church. So if we, if we really want to be careful... They have no concept of the church. Number two, the metaphorical language of the temple church analogy is not found in the Gospel of John. And Carson makes that clear. He says, nor does my father's house here refer to the church as a spiritual house or a temple of God. And he notes a handful of passages of Scripture. That metaphor is not found in the fourth Gospel. And so you're trying to make a metaphor out of the Gospel of John that does not exist. Number three, and I think this is very important. The language of my father's house, in my father's house are many mansions, is present tense. That means the father's house is already in existence. The church is not going to be in existence until almost eight weeks from now, seven and a half or so. You might as well say two months. In eight weeks, the church is going to be established. But when Jesus makes the statement right here, he's speaking to the father's house in present tense that it exists. But the church is not going to be established until the day of Pentecost. Number four, Chris Reeves writes, Jesus said he was going to go to the Father to prepare a place that he would come again and receive them unto myself. All of this activity is heavenward, not focused on earth. Jesus never said he was going to, pre uh, going to prepare, what he was going to prepare would be brought to the earth. The church is a relationship that is experienced here on earth earth. That's an interesting concept. Number five, there are some passages that have similar language speaking of the church, but there's a difference when someone is speaking of the Father's house instead of the house of God, and then maybe this is splitting hairs. But the church is referred to in 1 Timothy 3.15 as the house of God. Ephesians 2.19 as the household of God. 1 Peter 2.5 as being built up a spiritual house. In Hebrews 3.5 and 6, Christ is a son over His own house whose house we are. Now, to argue that the Jews would have understood the Father's house as a reference to the physical temple is a radical different claim than arguing that the Jews would understand the Father's house as a reference to the church. Page 9 of Nathan's article. And if we really are concerned about this context thing, and I think we should be, the historical cultural context of John 14 2, Jesus is speaking to Jews. But in all these other passages from the previous slide that talks about the church as a house of God, he's speaking about Christians. He's talking to a different group of people at this point, and that needs to be under consideration. So let's talk about Jesus for just a minute, making preparations. He says, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go prepare a place for you, I will come again. This suggests, as Carson mentions, that the place exists. Wherever Jesus is going, the Father's house, heaven, it exists. It's not that he arrives on the scene and then he's going to have to build everything, but it's already in existence. Now the word place, the preparation, by the way, he goes on to say, will be via the cross through the resurrection. And so Jesus, uh, in order for us to go to the Father, he's the way. He tells us that in verse 4, or verse 6. And so um, he's the way. And in order for him to be the way, he's going to have to go to the cross and offer himself as a sacrifice that we might have a way of uh, our sins to be forgiven, that we might be justified or declared righteous again and have a relationship with the Father that we might be able to spend an eternity with Him. 
So the preparation would be the death, burial, resurrection, the ascension back into heaven. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4 uh, define that process. I go to prepare a place. Now the word place comes from the Greek word topos. And it just means an area of any size, a place. Now, this is significant because this, there's a lot of people today who say, well, heaven's not real. This passage right here in the language, heaven is real. That's what it's teaching. Heaven is a real place. Jesus is not going to prepare a temple. The temple was already prepared for its service. By the way, Jesus just taught not long before that the temple in a few decades is going to be destroyed. Well, what's he going to go do to the temple that's getting ready to be destroyed? So he's talking about heaven, and heaven is real. Uh, this is the, the Greek word, by the way, that we render our English word topography, as in the physical features of an area. I thought that was kind of an interesting language. So there's similar language found about preparation in the Bible. Mark 10, 40 for those for whom it is prepared. Hebrews eleven sixteen, 16, He has prepared a city for them. 1 Peter 1, 4, reserved in heaven for you. These passages speak of a future dwelling with God, not a personal indwelling. That's what these passages are talking about. A dwelling with God, not a personal indwelling. So where is Jesus? He says He's going to go prepare a place, and if He goes to prepare a place... He will receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. Now this is what, I don't know what kind of language to call this, and so um, I called my, my Greek professor that taught me, and uh, we had this little discussion, and I finally decided to call it anticipatory language. I, I'm not real sure. So the argument is made where I am. Where's Jesus when he says this? He's on earth, therefore he's going to bring him back to earth. That, that's silly. Look at the context of what he's talking about. He's anticipating being somewhere. The Father's house are in heaven. That's where He's going to bring them to. How's this going to happen? 1 Thessalonians 4.17, He says, Then we who are alive and shall remain will be caught up with the Lord, uh, caught up with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always ever be with the Lord. Now, as far as I know, the Bible, when it talks about the second coming of Christ, and that's what He's speaking of in this passage, and I'm, my time's going to get away from me. We can't discuss any of that, but... He's talking about the second coming. As far as I know, Christ never says He's going to come back and put foot upon this earth. He's going to come back and we're going to meet Him in the clouds. And so Jesus coming back to this earth and being here and reigning for a period of time is a denominational concept that's not found in the Scriptures. Jesus is never coming back to place His foot upon this earth to physically be here. He's coming back to gather us and we're going to meet Him in the air and then He's going to take us to this Father's house or the heaven. Now, I told you just a little bit ago, if we want to consider the whole context, let's go back. Jesus begins in chapter 7 to talk about where I'm going. And He begins preparing. This is not something He just dumps on them all of a sudden, just uh, moments before He's going to be arrested and turned over and crucified. That's not at all what happens. He's been telling them for some time, I've got to go somewhere. Let's go back to John chapter 7. Verse 33 through 34, He says, I shall be with you a little while longer and then I go to him who sent me. You will seek me and not find me. And where I am, you cannot come. Fast forward to chapter 8, verse 21 through 23. Jesus said to them again, I am going away, and you will seek me, and will die in your sin. Where I go, you cannot come. So the Jews said, will he kill himself? Because he says, where I go, you cannot come. And he said to them, you are from beneath, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. He's going somewhere because he's not of this world. Chapter 12, verse 25 through 26. He who loves his life will lose it. He who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. Now, let's go to the immediate context. Chapter 13 and verse 3. Jesus said, He had come from God. He was going to God. In verse 33, He says, Where I am going, you cannot come. And in verse 36, He says, Where I am going, you cannot follow me. Jesus is going somewhere. And where He's going, at this point, the disciples are unable to come. 
He's going to heaven where the disciples are unable to come because preparation have not been made. Jesus hasn't died yet. The sacrifice hasn't been made. The means of justification or the gospel has not been put into effect at this point. That's all going to happen in just a matter of, of days, actually a matter of hours from this. So where is Jesus? Well, He does go to the cross. He dies. He's resurrected. He spends some time with them. And then in Acts chapter 1, He ascends back into heaven. And He says, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing into heaven? The same Jesus who was taken up from heaven will so come in like manner as you saw Him go into heaven. Where's Jesus? In heaven. Peter uses this on the day of Pentecost to preach his sermon. Speaking of Christ, he says, He has been exalted to the right hand of God. Where's the right hand of God? Heaven. That's a phrase that's often found. Paul says in Philippians 1.23, For I am hard-pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Um. Depart from what? This earth. To be where? With Christ. Where is Christ? In heaven. Hebrews 8.1 He's speaking to Jesus who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. Alright, one more where I am passage or where I'm going passage. And I want to save this one for last. 17.24 here Jesus says, now he's, he's concluded the private discourse and now he's in his prayer. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me, for you love me before the foundation of the world. Now what is Jesus speaking about in this passage? He has one more request. And that is, he wants his followers to see his pre-existent glory. That's what he wants. That's what Kostenberger says. Westcott makes this distinction. The words distinctly imply the personal pre-existence of Christ, the thought of eternal love active in the depths of divine being, presents perhaps as much as we can faintly apprehend to the doctrine of the essential trinity. We have seen those who were alive at the time of Christ. His glory, kind of. They saw His glory through His incarnation. That's what we're told in chapter 1 and verse 14. Through selected signs. This is the first sign in John 2 and verse 11 when Jesus turns the water to wine and through His death, burial, and resurrection. But no one has seen His glory as He is in heaven. That's, that's a different kind of glory, that pre-existent glory that the Son has. And John tells us in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when He is revealed, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. Now in this passage, Jesus is in heaven. He's not the He's talking about being in heaven. He's anticipating being in heaven. He's not talking about the church and He's not talking about a personal indwelling. And it's His prayer that they may be with Him in heaven. In conclusion, in Hebrews chapter 11, and I hope we get further clarification on this later on uh, this evening, but in Hebrews chapter 11, there appears to be something that these faithful are looking for. And in verse 10, for he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. And then when we skip to verse 13, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly, they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for He has prepared 
a city for them. God has prepared a place, a city, a heavenly home called heaven. And when these disciples are anxious, they've just been told that Jesus is going to die. They've just been told Peter's going to deny him. One of them is going to uh, betray them. They're upset. And Jesus says, don't worry about it. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And I'm going to the Father's house. That's heaven. And I'm going to come back. And you're going to be there. And when we get to verse 17, he says, and you're going to see something that you've never seen before. That's the conclusion.